now to the kind of main business of the first session, which is to welcome Professor Martin Hewitt, who requires no introduction to uh, a group of historians. So therefore, I will give him an introduction. Um, as you know, he's currently Dean of um, Music, Media and Humanities. Is that right? The other way around. But the yeah. other way around, <laughs> yes. A combination of these three at the uh, University of Huddersfield, the previous uh, director of the uh, Leeds Centre for Victorian Studies and a key player in the foundation of the Journal of Victorian Culture and Baths itself. You will also be familiar with his work, starting with his uh, uh, study of uh, Victorian Manchester, its politics um, and culture and society, and uh, his much more recent work on the uh, history of the Victorian press, um, which I'm sure is kind of you know, widely used by all of us. He's asked me not to say too much, um, so I'm going to avoid going on much, much longer and hand over to him for our, our, our second keynote lecture, which is on the subject of Victorian generations. Great. Uh, Rosemary, thanks very much. Um, yes, I think it's an embarrassingly large amount has been said already on a number of occasions over the course of the last uh, two days. So. I think that was quite and, and more than enough. And, and my apologies um, if, um, if uh, Black Eyed Peas was a little bit of an assault to the um, census <laughs> first thing on a Saturday morning after a, a Friday night um, conference dinner. I did think it might blow one or two cobwebs away. Um, I did think it might also create a kind of generational incongruity. Uh, I did think I might make that effect even better by trying to dance out front, but I'm, <laughs> I've, spared, I've spared you that. Um, but yeah, um, it's Lucy's fault. She, she encouraged me um, to, uh, to start with um, something that, that perhaps you wouldn't expect at the start of a, of a Babs uh, uh, keynote, particularly on um, Victorian generations. Um, although, obviously, the, um, the, the theme was... Uh, relevant enough, obviously. Okay, so um, we've got a passage here that was uh, pointed out to me by um, Rosemary, uh, and I'm delighted to be able to start with it um, because it gives me the excuse to preface this lecture, uh, not only with the conventional uh, thanks to conference organisers for the honour of this invitation, and it is um, an honour, um, but to, uh, to affirm my enormous debt to Rosemary and to all my um, former colleagues, several of which I, I see around the, the room uh, here at Trin Leeds Trinity, um, and indeed uh, my debt to the institution itself. Um, Leeds Trinity hired me as an inexperienced lecturer in 1991, even though I was manifestly unqualified to teach the 20th century international history they were looking primarily to cover. And in fact, I had one of the most embarrassing ex uh, interview experiences in my life, and I, I've had several, um, where I was, I was quizzed in detail about Mussolini's Corfu policy of 1922. I mean, I, I vaguely knew who Mussolini was, um, but that was about as far as it went. Anyway, they, they gave me the, the job, and within three years, um, they had provided me with the intellectual and financial resources to set up, as we've heard, a centre and an MA in Victorian studies, and even more outrageously, um, a new journal of Victorian culture. And in doing so, of course, had begun the process of turning an entirely conventional social historian of the 19th century um, into an aspiring interdisciplinary Victorianist who's probably still an entirely conventional social historian of the 19th century. Um, and I suspect that there, there would have been few other institutions in the country um, that would um, then or now have provided the opportunities and the support that Leeds Trinity gave me in the 1990s. And that support enriched and transformed my scholarly and my intellectual life and left me with an irredeemable debt. And of course, it, it's enabled the organisation of a series of Victorian Studies conferences here in the late 90s, which formed the prehistory to this Babs conference. Um, and so it has been an enormous thrill to, um, to see Babs back here, um, to see Horsforth once again, the, the site of the <coughs> annual gathering of, of Britain's Victorianists. Um, and, you know, it's been said before very generously, I think, already by, by Rowan, but um, I too think that Leeds Trinity has every right to be proud of its place. Um, I think we can say it's the crucible of the British Association for Victorian Studies. But to return to generations, 
if we're to be serious about age in Victorian Britain, just as, as if we, we are to be serious about the ages of Victorian Britain, we need to grapple with the question of generations. If I were to ask you how the Victorians responded to the death of Victoria um, or to some other event, your response might be that it rather depends. And if I asked you on what, you might say, well, on their class, their, their gender, their sexuality, their ethnicity. Um, but amid these contingencies of identity, how many of you would have started, at least before this conference, with the question of how old they were? Never mind to the slightly different but related question of which generation did they belong to? I think um, Young's quote is beautifully suggestive of some of the problematics of a generational approach. I wonder, and no Googling, how many of you, um, how old you think Pugin was at the time that Ruskin was born. But her opposition presents for us the broader potential for, a gener for uh, generational influences and distinctions to have helped to shape the Victorian period and to understand that. So, as we know, the idea of the generation is widely used in Victorian scholarship and has been widely shoehorned into um, a number of papers in this conference that I've heard and heard of. Um, we might think of Jim Secord's portrayal of, in Victorian sensation of the first generation of professional scientists, um, Spencer, Tyndall, Wallace and Huxley. Um, we might think of the 1860s generation of university reformers identified by Sheldon Rothblatt. We think of Yeats's tragic generation of the 1890s. We talk of first generation romantics and second generation romantics, of first and second generation women writers. We were hearing yesterday of first, second and even third generation pre-Raphaelites. So we use generations and we use them not only as a, as a structuring device but as a, a broader organising theme. It's got a very powerful lineage in uh, Victorian scholarship. Uh, of course, Theo Hoppen's New Oxford History of England's The Mid-Victorian Generation is itself a, a referencing of the subtitle of W.L. Burns' classic An Age of Equipoise, a study of the mid-Victorian generation. And modern scholarship continues to, to, to splatter its texts with um, the generation as a structuring and as a, a narrative device. Um, just to give you one example, there are 60 references to generation and another eight to generations in the 300 pages of Michael Roberts's um, study of 19th century voluntarism, Making English Morals of 2004. Um, it may even be that we're witnessing something of a, a broader turn to generations born out of the attention to ageing, which has been reflected in this conference, um, in renewed interest in the histories of parenting, as well as in recent books, I'm thinking of Heather Ellis's Generational Conflict and University Reform, Oxford in the Age of Revolution from 2012, uh, or Thomas Otte's The Foreign Office Mind, The Making of British Foreign Policy, 1865 to 1914 from 2011, both of which manifest renewed efforts to, disploy, to deploy generation as a key concept. Allowing for, for all this, it has to be said that scholarly deployment of the notion of generation remains shamefully ill-defined and imprecise. In using the idea of generation, we offer a spurious specificity which is dissembling, if not consciously dishonest. Part of the problem is the limits of existing theory which has moved little from foundational essays of, of Karl Mannheim in the 1920s and the less generally cited work of Jose Ortega y Gasset in the 1920s and 30s. Okay, so far so discouraging. I'm, I'm, I, do, I do discouraging well, as uh, some people who went through the JVC editorial process in the 90s were <laughs> really but I think the concept of generations does have its uses, and I take encouragement from the suggestion of Franco Moretti, albeit through gritted teeth, that some kind of generational mechanism might be the key to understanding, for example, the, the cycles of popularity of Victorian novel genres. Okay, so what I hope to do in the rest of uh, this morning is to offer uh, ways towards a more effective way of thinking about Victorian generations, both in terms of conceptualization and methodology. Um, I hope my materials will range uh, sufficiently broadly to offer points of reference for 
most of you in the, in the room. Um, but I, I, I confess from the outset um, that Victorian fiction, Victorian novelists, are not a primary focus of what I have to say. Largely for reasons which I'll allude to later, um, but also I think mindful of my new understanding of the, the new 21st century Victorian studies. That, that in, in that Victorian studies, historians need to know their place. So, it's not my intention, um, although, actually, although it wasn't my intention, much of what I have to say returns to some of my previous uh, preoccupations with periodization. Um, but primarily, I think my argument is that supplanting, uh, supplementing our traditional categories of gender, nationality, class, etc., uh, with age, we can achieve a much clearer sense of what Brodel once called the multiplicity of time in each historical moment. So, for both soci sociologists and for historians, the 20th century has offered uh, powerful evidence of the existence and significance of generational identity groups. Both the trans transnational and the mass, the lost generation of 1914, Generation X, the 60s generation, Generation Y, um, and the national and often more narrowly constituted groups, the Spanish Generation of 98. Um, or the Irish generation of 1916. And in these contexts, generation has appeared to constitute a, a foundational component of self-identity, in particular of youth movements, and has produced a narrative of generational sequence and supersession. And of course, the emergence of this sort of self-conscious generational identity is very much visible in the final decades of, of the Victorian generations, comprising those born in, the, in its last decades, but living as adults mostly after <coughs> 1901. Um, so, for example, um, Alan uh, Lascelles here. Um, but also, thinking about Alfred Orridge and the, the New Age, the New Age described by Storm Jameson as the Bible of my generation which consciously addressed itself to a, a generation rising that finds tidbits useless and TPs weakly unsatisfactory. I, mean, I think if we look at the Edwardian per, um, period, we can see it being marked not just by um, the rhetorical opposition of older and younger generations, um, though this certainly uh, intensified, nor even just by a widening of the generation gap into more of a gulf. Um, but crucially by the active adoption of generational identities <coughs> by protagonists, uh, the development of, of lateral generational solidarities um, and, and the, 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 the greater sense of the, the narrowing and specificity of the generational layers that operated in society. And of course, this generational solidarity and alienation was immeasurably intensified by the First World War, um, a formative experience um, of, the power of, of power unlike anything that the Victorian period had to offer. Not least, of course, because the price of the war in lives lost was paid predominantly by a cohort of young men. And so you'll be, you'll be more than aware of the, of the kinds of, um, of, uh, of, of responses that perhaps for me are summed up by um, Mary Butts's comment in 1928, that I belong to the war-ruined generation. Those years lie like a fog on my spirit, mud, sloth of despair, cynicism, panic. Moving into the 19th century, it's not quite so obvious that we can see those kinds of responses and those kinds of dynamics. Um, there are, interestingly, fainter echoes of the 20th century um, pattern visible in some of the movements in Britain of the 1840s both in the Young England movement, which perhaps is the closest, and it's not that close, we get to get in the 19th century to continental generational movements, um, associated, of course, with the novels of Disraeli, Coningsby, the new generation of 1844. But interestingly, also elsewhere, for example, in the Oxford movement, um, where through the work of Peter Knuckles and others, it's possible to get a real feel of the contribution that a sense of generational revolt made to Tractarianism. 
But beyond these framing moments, I would suggest that Victorian Britain offers few of the sorts of movements of generational revolt visible in the subsequent century. And indeed, that there was nothing in Victorian self-conceptions to match the readiness with which they themselves interpreted the contemporary history of the European continent in broad generational patterns, as in the case of France, where Victorians saw very clearly the generation of 1789 being replaced by generations of 1820 and 1830 and the discouraged generation of 1850 and, and so on. So I think where we need to start from is the, the notion that in various ways applying 20th century models and working back from 20th century expectations to the Victorians is actually not going to be terribly helpful. Now, at first, at first sight, this seems um, entirely counterintuitive. Um, the, most, the most cursory uh, of samplings demonstrates that Victorians, um, like we Vic Victorianists, were fond of a generational reference or 30, making all necessary allowances for the crudity of the data. Um, if we look at um, a Google n-gram, we can see not just a, uh, a significant um, uh, um, <coughs> frequency of the, of the use of generations, but also the way in which it increases and, 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 and um, accelerates away from some of the other kinds of, of um, synonyms that we might, um, that we might expect. Um, part of the problem is that, that this doesn't get us very far. Uh, what the engram doesn't do, of course, is distinguish the range of signification that's attached to generation, not only as a noun but as a verb, but also its, via its, uh, its multiple meanings. It doesn't tell us about changes in the pattern of usage over time. Um, the Victorians invoked the idea of generation prolifically, but also indiscriminately. And if we, um, and we need to approach these usages with the sort of of syntactical care recently urged by Helena Michi. The generation when and the generation which of Eliza Lynn Linton's comments here um, I think suggests some of the complications that we, um, that we need to confront when we're looking at the Victorians' usages of generation. And I think for the purposes of the discussion, uh, it will be helpful to kind of keep in our minds a number of, um, of different types of usage, uh, which we might describe as conventional, as temporal, as genealogical, as psychological, and as sociological. And indeed, within those so sociological um, variants, which is the one that I'm particularly interested in, um, that distinction between... Um, the generation as a demographic cohort, a set uh, merely defined by an a priori or an arbitrary um, age range, and a generation as an identity group, um, which, um, as uh, defined by Karl Mannheim, um, shares a common location in the social and historical process, which thereby limit them to a specific range of potential experience, predisposing them for a certain characteristic mode of thought and experience, and a characteristic type of historically relevant action. Superficially, there are frequent signs in Victorian literature, uh, Victorian prose, of a self-conscious generational identity. Um, multiple references to our generation or my generation. But before the 1890s, almost without exception, these derive from a religious rhetoric of service, which invoke a biblical concept of time in which my generation or our generation stands, along with the present generation, for the time or world in which I live, nowadays, rather than any sociological one of my age group. And in effect, these were just part of a range of cliched uses that also indicated historical stability from generation to generation, long periods of indeterminate time, successive generations, the future, future generations, or of course, the rising generation, uh, Punch's favorite, and perhaps I should have given more attention to Punch and the rising generation, but I'm afraid that's a, a paper for a, another day. <laughs> 
So, as a noun, generation is most often deployed as a unit of historical time, a span of between 25 and 33 years, than as a collective in indivi of, of individuals. Um, and in this sense, of course, um, the generation um, is a found one of the foundational units of Victorian historicism. Um, you know, it, it encapsulated here in um, in Mill. But I think the other interesting thing about um, Victorian uses of generations is not just that they um, they lack any real sense of of kind of belonging or self identity, but they they lack any real sense of purchase for the Victorians through much of the period on 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 Victorian Britain um, themselves. Um, it is possible to see, and we were hearing one version um, yesterday when we, we heard about Janet Ross, um, and it's certainly very visible if one looks at the, uh, the case of, of Leslie Stevens, who's been uh, well um, studied, to find um, accounts structured around familial uh, generations. Um, but, but these create a very different kind of genealogical um, uh, approach, a, a very different kind of genealogical sequence. Um, than the sociological ones that I think are going to be more um, useful to us. Um, so we need, I think, to register that, that where Victorians move beyond the temporal, they do so predominantly within, within what we can describe as a genealogical frame. The interplay of those strata of grandparents, parents, aunts and uncles, children, nieces and nephews that provide clear generational structures with, with, within family and kin networks. Um, and of course, Deborah Epstein Nord has, has, has uh, reminded us recently um, that the autobiographies from, from Mill to Ghost com composed a, a kind of historical fugue counterpointing offspring and, and, and parent. Um, and these are often seen as representative of broader, what I might describe as sociological uh, generational tensions. And of course, Ghost's father and son starts with the prefatory claim to present a study of the conflict between two temperaments, two consciences, almost two epochs. But in fact, not least because of uh, the unrepresentativeness of, of the, the Plymouth Brethren context in which Goss is working, um, but also um, because of his own sustained reluctance to present himself in any emblematic way, in reality what we get is something much, much, much narrower um, that, than that. And this, I think, is, 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 is where the, the difficulty of looking at kind of fictional constructions of uh, novelistic constructions of uh, the generation um, come in. Um, I think it is certainly true, and we can find um, uh, uh, examples if we, if we start looking of, of a, a, an aspiration to work across this, this boundary to use the genealogical to think about the sociological. Um, I mean, in the, in, in the, uh, at one point, George Eliot uh, is recorded as um, remarking in private um, that, uh, that her sole purpose in writing The Mill on the Floss was to show the conflict which is going on everywhere when the, long, the younger generation with its higher culture comes into collision with the older. Uh, and a little later in the century, um, E.F. Benson claimed of Dodo, a detail of the day from 1893, that, that the eponymous heroine is not a portrait of any one person, but a compound of many characters blended in one type. She is the incarnation of the contrast that exists between this and the previous generations. The difficulty, though, of using these kinds of, um, of, of texts as a way into a, a broader understanding of the Victorian generations is the way in which they <sighs> that they don't really consider or explore the, 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 the dynamics of lateral solidarity to be, between people of a, of a similar age. They think very much in terms of those, later, those kind of vertical um, 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 points of friction and tension that run between, uh, up through families. Um, because they tend ultimately to fall back on kind of psychological or um, what, of course, Bruce Maslisch in the case of um, 
John Stuart Mill um, famously tried to, to, to describe as Oedipal dynamics. Um, and I think we can see this kind of thing. We can see it in, in Samuel Butler. We can see it a little later in Arnold Bennett's Clayhanger, which to me offers a fictional representation of his earlier observations um, of his own parent-child relationship in a, a diary entry of 1897, uh, which I'm grateful for Ruth Robbins, um, which talks about his father um, and writes, I, I noticed the approach of middle age upon him. I felt acutely that he and I were of different generations, that parent and child, be they never so willing, can never come intellectually together simply because one's time of life differs crudely and har one time of life differs crudely and harshly from another. So I think whereas in the 20th century generational identity uh, has become an effect of coming of age, in Victorian England it was, all, it was more powerfully an effect of becoming aged. Almost as often as biographical accounts dwell on parent-child rebellions uh, without invoking wider generational identities, they spoke of the distancing effects of advancing age in explicitly generational terms. And while I've located very little discussion of generational transitions triggered by the usurpations of the young, definitions of change rooted in Victorian necrologies are commonplace. So for Frederick Harrison, the death of one generation is the birth of another. And this is a tendency um, very marked in um, the writings of um, Bajo, which we'll come to in, in other writings of um, Ghosts, uh, in, a, in a broad range of writings, particularly in the, in the, in the later decades of the, of the century. So as I've said, it may be that the idea of the generation as a historical actor first emerges at the time of the French Revolution, but in England, there's very little contemporary self-ascription. What we miss is any powerful sense of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of, of belonging, of the extension, we might say, of generational dynamics from kin to kith. I had hoped to talk a little bit about um, the Victorian uh, women's movement and, 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 uh, and the historiography of, of the Victorian women's movements, um, because actually, in, in very interesting ways, both in terms of the, of the, of the, of the nature of the, of the history and of the historiography, um, they, do, um, they do work through some of these uh, potentials and some of these um, problems. But I think perhaps for the purposes of time, I will... Um, I will, I will pass on. But, but there are um, what, what we tend to find elsewhere, kind of just incipient kind of flashes of the sorts of um, a broader sense of, of, of kind of generational identity of uh, new um, uh, emerging groups within the, the women's movement as long as, as alongside very interesting sets of negotiations about the, 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 the genealogical um, and mentoring relationships of of, of mothers and daughters, of aunts, um, used within family relationships and often uh, also adopted uh, beyond family relationships. Um, but um, but let's, get, let's, let's move on to, to Bajo and uh, a, um, a famous, uh, a well-known, I hope, um, uh, extract from the English Constitution of 1873. Um, because I think that notwithstanding, again, uh, uh, further outbreaks of um, congenital pessimism, uh, a generational consciousness does break through the surface of Victorian culture sufficiently frequently to suggest that there is something at work, um, albeit not something that the terms of traditional 20th century derived theories um, um, easily accommodate. Um, and I think... Um, the, the writings of Bajo in general, and, and this passage in particular, give us one e example of that. Um, Bajo's work very interestingly plays with the, 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 the implications of generation and evolutionary thought. Um, his essays offer a, a number of senses of watersheds in British history, in particular around 1830 when he says, a, a generation who did not remember the horrors of the French Revolution and had been teased to death by hearing their parents talk about them came to influence affairs. Um, and in this well-known passage, of course, he argued that the, the visible transition in British history um, that occurred um, at the end of the 1860s um, was not um, generated by the overt agents of change, 
but rather by a change of generation. And I think in, 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 in um, Victorian prose, we can also see a shift from generations as periods to generations as age cohorts, um, which is most easily visible in the much greater recognition of the coexistence of generations, and ultimately of, uh, not just of the binary conflict between younger and older, um, but of a, of a sense of a, of a, more, a more complex um, section of an older generation, a, a generation passing into middle age, a younger generation coming into um, manhood. And I think um, one of the earlier uh, examples I've come across is of, a, um, of a move to, towards this kind of sensibility comes in, um, it's published in the, uh, um, the memoirs of um, Sir Robert Moray in um, 1912, but it's actually um, the uh, reprint of a, of a letter from March 1864 uh, from Moray to Lady Salisbury, um, which offers a, a sense of his sense of the way in which changes in the kind of cultural velocity of Victorian Britain were creating uh, greater overlaps between generations and a need to think about the way in which these layers were operating um, with each other. So I think these kinds of um, um, uh, passages uh, give us one justification for further exploration of the idea of, of generations. Um, and I think another can be provided by um, even a, a cursory uh, examination of some of the kind of or organisational uh, phenomena of, um, of, um, of Victorian life. So here's, here's the, the, um, uh, the, the authors of the, of the essays on the, a liberal education, uh, 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 a book of the early 1870s, which was really advocating uh, university reform, and some of the people there will be mentioned, uh, be familiar to you, some of them less so. Henry Sidgwick, one of the people that um, Helen obviously started us off with. Um, what perhaps is less um, apparent is the, uh, the generational identity of this group, and the, uh, with the exception of the, the two at the bottom, one a, um, a, a, an Eton uh, professor, a teacher, and, and the other one, uh, Richard Mumpton Mill's um, uh, uh, kind of uh, literary um, um, eminence greens, as it were. The, the very powerful um, generational solidarity of these authors um, from 1829 until 1838. Uh, and given that Sidgwick went to university extremely young and therefore was ahead of his generation, you know, in some respects, as a, as a university generation, even more um, tightly confined. Okay, so you might expect that in terms of university generations um, uh, uh, and the particular kind of contacts that are formed there. But we can, as we look, find this elsewhere. So here are the Fabian Society um, uh, of Founders. Um, and here are their birth dates with the one that I haven't yet been able to identify. And again, you see a, a remarkably tight uh, generational pattern uh, being established there. And just to give you one further example that we were hearing about yesterday, uh, the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood. Um, so we may think of the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood in kind of stylistic terms. We may think about them, you know, emerging and kind of creating a, an impact on the, on the art scene in 1848. But do we always recognise just quite how tightly... Um, bound they were by kind of um, age, by generational ties. So I think there's something here that it is worth us um, um, exploring. So let me give you, let me give you this. Uh, entirely as a selective and suggestive uh, piece. Um, and what, what we have here are um, a set of, um, uh, of, of groups, um, some tightly defined... Um, uh, like the Pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and the, and the clique, an earlier art group, um, the founders of the New English Art Club, some slightly less uh, well-defined, like the Vorticists, which include both the signers of the Manifesto and a number of other um, very close and re recognised um, associates. Um, and some, in a sense, kind of historiographical um, constructs. I, I couldn't resist but put the decadence up there for reasons which will become apparent um, earlier. So these are um, representations of the membership in five-year cohorts around their uh, median age. And the thicker the cohort, the, the higher the proportion of their membership which comes in that cohort. And I think you can see, you know, perhaps what you might expect, but in some respects, in a, in a, in a, often in a, in a, in a uh, 
uh, unexpectedly concentrated form, the, 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 the generational um, um, uh, cohesiveness of these groups. Um, And I, I, we'll come back to this in a minute, but it seems to me that we can begin, as a result, to map on to these kinds of, um, of groupings, something which might get us towards um, a, um, um, a, a, a generational um, uh, a patterning for um, Victorian Britain more generally. Now, I know there are all kinds of problems with... Um, Art, art, art and the particular dynamics that we're talking about. Um, in fact, frankly, there are all kinds of problems about anything I'm going to say from here on in. Um, but nevertheless, I think um, what I have to say um, is um, hopefully going to be suggestive. Um, because looking at the, uh, at the, at the, 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 the prose passages, um, looking at the kind of generational constructions, looking at those kinds of um, institutional patterns and others uh, that we might pick from uh, other fields, um, uh, uh, politics, history of science, wherever, um, it seems to me that, 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 that there is scope, perhaps, for thinking about the way in which generations and generational solidarities are structuring um, aspects of Victorian um, social, um, uh, cultural, um, intellectual life. So that's what I'm going to try and do. Um, so just a, a couple of, of, of kind of obvious kind of methodological cautions. Um, what I'm trying to do is think very much about demographic groups and not specific periods. Um, but, all, but because they're still fundamentally based on the, uh, the classic Mannheim model that generations derive from sharing similar experiences at a similar life stage, they will obviously be tied in some senses to our, um, our notions of, of Victorian periodization. Um, so we'll be looking at the way in which they might align to specific moments and events and intellectual movements um, during their uh, period of uh, late adolescence, early adulthood, of potential kind of maximum re um, um, receptivity and openness to change, of exactly the kind of thing that George Bernard Shaw is talking about here um, um, in, uh, in his comment about um, the, the impact of Darwin uh, on him. Um, of course, what I'm going to try and argue is that, uh, that well, as I think is self-apparent, that, that these things don't come um, in regular waves or in kind of fixed uh, bands or with similar intensities. So that inevitably, as we try and, and construct a Victorian generational model, it will be messy and uneven um, and um, have uh, different thicknesses. But that if we are serious about thinking about generations in this way and, and, and trying to liberate them from um, a genealogical notion of uh, generation, um, which has often dominated the notions of the length of the generational interval, then we probably will end up with something a lot um, tighter than the 25 to 33 year convention, something nearer the 15 to 20 years. Um, okay, so there are all kinds of problems when thinking about boundaries. We need to recognize that they are fuzzy and overlapping, but for the for kind of various purposes, it makes sense to, to think about um, um, uh, uh, conventional dividing lines which give us a, um, a, a grouping that sits within them. Okay, so. You've had a, a kind of a sneak preview, as it were, but, but what on earth might this um, generational uh, schema look like? Um, and this is where I, I, I kind of steal myself and, uh, and show you something that, frankly, you really oughtn't to see because it's, it's, uh, it's particularly half-formed. There was a moment at the conference, I think, I can't remember when it was, when someone made some comment about it, the shame that, that we only ever hear conferences kind of fully polished and prepared papers. Uh, it might have been Nick, actually. So, so here we are. This is my response, something which is about as far away from a fully polished and, and, um, and finished um, uh, paper as you can imagine. What if the Victorian generations looked something like this. What if we think about a series of formative periods, um, a series of influences that exist within those formative periods, and as a result, a, a, a set of birth dates, a birth range, both a, a kind of core, and then obviously outside that, a margin when the, the identities become increasingly um, tenuous. Um, what if we try to identify a series of movements which are 
um, um, particularly associated or perhaps aligned with the kind of characteristics that we um, think of of those generations. And what if we then start to see which sort of people fit in uh, within generations and which sorts of people, even though they live uh, or they were born quite close to each other, start falling out into to different generations. As indeed, as it happens in this schema, Pugin and Ruskin do. Although um, Pugin was four or five. Four or five when Ruskin was born. So actually, they don't really work in many respects as different generational figures, even though Young clearly thought that they, that they did. Okay, so this is where I, I, you, 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 you've had enough time to kind of get over your initial shock, and you're, you're thinking, I really can't believe that, uh, that, um, that he's trying to uh, sell this to us. But okay, that's fair enough. I'm, 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 I'm happy to go into battle for these kinds of things. And, and you know, there's certainly, there's certainly plenty to do with it. There's a, there's a, there's a real kind of uh, Victorian parlour game um, to be had here, I think. Um, and so, for example, let's... Um, Let's have a think. Um, Grant Allen. Where would we... Uh, some of you may know Grant Allen's birthday, in which case that's not fair, you can't play. <laughs> <laughs> but for those of you who don't, Grant Allen, um, where would you fit him? Is he a, a high Victorian, along with kind of Creighton and Dilk, um, Sidgwick and Morley? Um, or is he a, a late Victorian um, with Ghosts and Stevenson, uh, George Moore, Gissing? Is he even a, an Edwardian, perhaps, with Sickert and Benson, Kipling and, and Yates? I don't know. This is where the voting pads would be handy, but we didn't get that far. <laughs> uh, so, for me, um, Grant Allen um, sits quite nicely with what we're describing as late Victorians. Uh, and indeed, that's where his birthday uh, uh, um, does sit, because Grant Allen was born in, in 1858. So we could, we could carry on and we could have a go. Uh, Winston Churchill, uh, there's a, a, Victorianist to, uh, a, a Victorian to, to conjure. Um, born 1874, as we would expect, as a kind of classic Edwardian liberal. Um, the, the, the nomenclature I'm particularly kind of unhappy and uncertain with because in many respects it really ought to be a nomenclature based on their, their formative moment if they are the, the generation of the 1820s or what have you. Um, but because of obviously the way the, the demographic lag works and the way in which they then become the kind of people that we recognise at particular moments, um, it seemed for the purposes of this exercise to, to, to make sense to think of them like this. And anyway, I couldn't come up with a whole series of of kind of really credible names for them if I was trying to kind of push them back to their uh, periods of influence. Okay, so that's all well and good. Um, what might we do with this? How might we try and make uh, 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 any attempt to, to see if it's got any sort of kind of uh, 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 heuristic usefulness or, or empirical um, credibility? Um, well, as I've said, we, what we're not going to find are a whole series of kind of generational um, or, or, or generations acting in generational ways as self-consciously um, kind of um, uh, 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 kind of establish uh, uh, you know, new kind of cultural forms or what have you. We're not going to find 20th century um, generations in that sense. So obviously, one way to go for to go back with it will be to. To, to start doing, carry on doing work in the, in the organisational structures of Victorian Britain and just see how well they do map onto some sense of generations and with all the various difficulties that that might have. Um, but my sense is what we are looking for is what we might describe as generational effects rather than as generational actors. Can we, can we identify points at which uh, it looks like the generations help us to make sense of things which are happening? So uh, in order to do that, what um, uh, I want to just briefly do is to take up a question which appears with increasing frequency in the later years of the Victorian period, the sense to which Victorian literature culture has begun to stagnate, ossified by the dead weight of early Victorian grandees who refused to die decently in good time and to leave the way clearer for younger talent. As Grant Allen put it in 1882, 
With the solitary and damning exception of Mr. Malik, it would, seem, it would be hard to name a single writer of the present generation who has achieved even a decent reputation before he was 40. So what if we could map the authorship of Victorian periodicals generationally? What if we had um, um, taken the, 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 the rich data from the Wellesley um, Index and, um, and, 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 and put it in such a form that we could begin to um, look at, at, at age uh, cohort frequencies. So what we've done is to, is to start doing that, and we, um, we have about 13,500 um, uh, entries of uh, individual contributions and their auth authors, and therefore obviously the birth dates of those authors, um, stretching across Westminster Review, the Quarterly Review, um, Blackwood's magazine, Fraser's magazine, uh, mostly through the entire period, and then a number of shorter runs, Ainsworth, Macmillan's, the London Quarterly, the 19th century. And again, there are a whole series of kind of technical difficulties here, and the, the data's still a little bit um, dirty. Um, okay, we could, as I have done, run a random 15-year cohort analysis of uh, the appearance of uh, different uh, uh, cohort groups in, um, in Wellesley from 1824 up to 1900. And because there is obviously a statistical effect of uh, age group, we will begin to get these kind of patterns of rising and decline. So the purple goes up and then down, and blue goes up and down, and et cetera, et cetera. You know, the bigger the group, the, the broader the group, the more that statistical effect will be apparent. Uh, the tighter the group, um, the less uh, it will be apparent. And OK, so we can kind of see what we might expect. And it, but it, it's a bit of a, bit of a jumble. I'm not sure there's, there's a huge amount to be... Um, um, to be taken from that, the, the mid-Victorians, as we've described them, kind of appear as you would expect in the mid-Victorian period, and, and the, the, uh, the high Victorians do, and then and they don't perhaps um, disappear as quickly as they, um, as they ought to have done. <coughs> but what happens, I'm sorry, the colours haven't come out very well on that, but what happens if we run that with the cohorts that I identified before. And it seems to me that a number of very interesting things happen when we use those cohorts. Um, in the first place, the generational cycles become much more apparent. We're still dealing with pretty much the same kind of approximately 15-year um, units. Um, so this is not an effect of, of, of magnitude per se. It's an effect of the fact that those cohorts somehow fit this data better. So we can see um, and the early Victorians, the mid-Victorians, we can see the high Victorians emerging, and then, and then we can see things not quite working towards the end of the Victorian period. The high Victorians don't really disappear to let the, the late Victorians take their place. And in a sense, that, of course, is what the argument was about. And that's one of the, the things that we say about um, the periodization of the Victorians, that it becomes much more difficult so we see that, and that's interesting, but we, we kind of saw a bit of that in the previous um, slide. But I think what's particularly interesting about this slide is the way in which the points of transition align. So the early Victorians emerge very rapidly into this period of prominence around 1834-35. They are superseded around 1850-1851. They are again themselves superseded around 68-70. It looks like they ought to be superseded around the mid to late 1880s. So there's, there's, no, there's no designed in effect here. I took the data and I ran the cohorts. Uh, I had no idea what I was going to, accept, ex to get, and this is what I did get. So that suggests to me that, um, like them or um, loathe them, those generational cohorts provide some way of explaining um, and patterning a set of uh, data about the people who are contributing to um, Victorian periodicals. OK, I've outstayed my welcome. I'll finish. Um, so of course, I present this with a great deal of trepidation. Um, I'm mindful of, of Tom Otty's warning that one of the fascinations of the generational approach is that the more you try to apply it, the more it has dissolved into vapid general generalities and boneless speculations. So there we are. I offer you that as, a, as an immediate response. I'll be checking Twitter um, <laughs> later. Um, <laughs>
And I guess also I'm, I'm, I'm aware that, that it might appear that I'm trying to persuade you that, that it's time for the, for the Victorian studies Adrian Mole moment. <laughs> so that, that henceforth it should be Modern Painters, Volume 1 by John Ruskin, aged 24. <laughs> and I guess I'm not, although I am kind of interested in the significance of that age, which I think, you know, um, many of us who, 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 who use and, and, and work with Ruskin don't, don't recognise, don't, don't register. But having started by suggesting that we, we need a more robust and precise sense of generation, uh, if we're to carry on using it in the ways we do, I do hope I've demonstrated that, um, that there are ways in which we might think about how we can do this, and that in doing so we have the possibility of throwing new light, fresh light, on the nature of Victorian Britain. Um, perhaps only in, in reinforcing our conventional sub-periods, um, as well as perhaps uh, reinforcing the arguments that, that I and others have advanced already about um, the, its overarching coherence as a, as a single uh, cultural period. Um, I would say that, that generations are not the dramatic personae of 19th century history, um, but they potentially offer us a structuring force as powerful as race uh, or class uh, or, or gender. But we'll not achieve this by simply applying existing, predominantly 20th century derived uh, approaches to generations. We will need to articulate a new conceptual frame which avoids youth focused models of generational revolt, looks to generational spans identified empirically and not deductively, accommodates the fuzzy and the overlapping nature of generational definition and understands the multi generational composition of society at any one particular point in time. And if we do so, a renewed generational analysis will help to affirm that age matters. Not just ageing, but the implications of age-related solidarities and tensions, of collective memories and rituals of identity. We'll not properly understand the Victorian period, or indeed any modern period, unless we effectively map and locate not just... Um, the effects of the conventional structuring forces that we identify, uh, but the effects of age. And, if, uh, and unless we register and accommodate the thick, layered time that age produced. And that will require not just new methods of analysis, which I hope the digital humanities will help us to provide, um, but new modes of, 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 of what I think we might describe as, as, as deep, or, or in Carlylean terms, solid, um, narrative approaches. Okay, so the research here is uh, limited and my conclusions, um, preliminary, premature, ludicrous, take your, your pick. Um, but I think we have established enough to know that the Victorian experience of generational consciousness and dynamics was quite different to continental patterns and to its adjacent um, ages. And I, for one, welcome the extent um, to which such research will therefore continue to require interdisciplinary approaches which are mindful of national and chronological exceptionalities and so help to justify the continued vitality of a British Association for Victorian Studies and indeed of the role of Victorian Studies as a site for theoretical development and not just arid empiricism. Really, who'd have thought it? Thank you. <laughs> for that illuminating and fascinating and also educational piece on uh, kind of the Victorian ge generations. We, I think we can certainly take 10 minutes for questions, and I'm sure there are a lot of people who would like to uh, ask Martin a bit more about his preliminary conclusions on the, I think it's called data mining, she says, as a person who desperately avoids this sort of thing. Um, I'm just going to, whilst you're thinking what you might like to ask, get out the uh, roving mic and see whether it's going to talk to us this morning. Um, oh, thanks, for, thanks very much, Martin. Um, I work on the history of children. I just want to say, I, I don't actually see anything really problematic about what you're talking about. I mean, the idea that, 
you know, we need to understand the Victorians' conception of generation in their own terms seems perfectly um, a reasonable thing. And I just want to say, I think a way into this that I've been working on is um, through the history of children and the family surprise. Um, but one example is um, some of the findings in my research is that I'm arguing actually children have a new prominence in worshipping communities, in churches and chapels, because there's from the early 19th century, because there's so much enthusiasm to get more children into school, children of all social classes, but particularly the poorer, that you know that they make more space for children when they're building new churches. Um, you know, there are um, okay, we'll read my chapter on this, but you know, there is actually very much a kind of interest in including the new generations, which may not be um, discussed in that language, but it's quite, you know, does seem to be a new development. It's, it's, I hope that makes some sense. It does, and I, you know, I, I mean, I, I, I'm sure it's, it, it's kind of inherent, isn't it? It's intrinsic to what we do, but, but I did find myself, write, you know, been writing and, and, and trying to work out how to, to, um, um, uh, you know, to kind of uh, um, boil down the, the essence of what I wanted to argue, just to be aware of the of the kind of hugely problematic and and uh, and and, and uh, sometimes you know potentially offensive um, assumptions in almost every uh, um, uh, sentence. And and I am very aware that one of my operating principles is that that you know in some senses we can kind of ignore that that first kind of tranche. The, kind of the up to 15s, they're, they're not part of the kind of public culture that I'm particularly interested in. And of course, that's, um, that's, that's not necessarily a, um, a terribly satisfactory way to, to progress. But I think, obviously, including that, that further uh, tranche and thinking about thick time does, you know, it is consistent and does just, just kind of, I think, enhance what I'm, I'm trying to suggest. I mean, I mean as Fane pointed out, they're actually very high proportion of the population through much of the Victorian era, the young, so something like 40% are under 20, so they can't really be ignored, but yeah. that wasn't a criticism, yeah. it's just an aspect of that society. Thank you very much. I think Nathan has a question. I wonder whether you want to be our technology guy for the morning. Um, okay. um, do the generation idea tends to need a really clumsy view of human nature. You mentioned life phases. So you learn in the first 30 years, you draw on those experiences and elaborate them in the next 30, and then you get locked in by them in the final, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, the Victorians never quite got that. They had all the ideas and they toyed with them, but they, they tried not to be clumsy with it. Um, a generation needs to be locked in by the events and they need to be um, held by those, the eternal, you know, like you play in the Black Eyed Peas, the eternally youthful uh, person uh, kind of mars the idea of a generation because they get on board with later sort of trends. Um, it, can we have an idea of generation if, if they try to avoid clumsiness? I think, I think it, in all these things, um, the more we, we, we reduce what we're doing to... Um, Kind of value systems or other forms of kind of ideological construction, the worse they will be. Um, but I think you know, I would say perhaps um, give you a kind of counterpoint to, to, to your, your kind of intellectual argument and say, what about um, kind of friendship networks? What about um, uh, networks of kind of intermarriage <coughs> and those kinds of things? You you often do get locked in, or at least you know to an extent get locked into those kinds of relationships and the kinds of formative influences that they construct at an early age. So yeah, you know, we can't, we can't be uh, too crude about any of these things, but I think we can't also ignore the, some of the, of the structuring forces that, that generation does still nevertheless create. Hello, I'm Amy Twain. <laughs> I'm Amy wondered, um, your kind of, the generations that you showed us and the patterns that you showed us were very much based on the kind of Victorian greats, <laughs> as they were partly kind of memorialising themselves and as we've memorialised them. So would it work, would it look the same, would the generational patterns look the same if we put in trade unionists or, you know, train drivers or, you know, everyday folk? Um, 
I mean, there are, there are at least two, if not more, kind of, you know, really in, important and significant questions there. One is um, a question about, you know, how far are we doing what, again, I've, well, what, I'm, what am I doing, what, I, again, I've kind of spent my life desperately trying to set my face against, which is to reduce Victorian history to the patterns created by a very narrow kind of intellectual elite. Um, and I think that's a very um, dangerous one. And it's in, it is implicit in some of the tensions that exist in the way in which we use uh, generations more generally as, as historians. And, and I suppose that, f for me, the, 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 you know, the juxtaposition, therefore, of the, um, of the, uh, the SAS on liberal education reform, the Fabians and the Pre-Raphaelites did kind of provide me with a, a, some sort of reassurance that something more is going on here. Um, <laughs> Did I put it on? No, I didn't put it on in the end. Sorry. What I what I have I have done is sorry um, is um, is done a, a, a more detailed mapping. Don't look at that. A more detailed mapping um, of um, of women's groups to this generation. And in some respects, it it it, it works, but not quite. In that there appears to be a kind of three-year lag. It works better if you advance all the divisions, three years. What, the women are ahead or behind? The women. <laughs> well, th th we're not talking, you know, these are not, obviously, they're not progressive, are they? They are, they're just the kind of coherences that operate. Now, it may be that if, you know, if we look at the, the way in which the influences operate, there may be a slight kind of lag in the way in which they, they are become cohesive. Um, so, so, yes, you're, you're kind of pushing the, the dates three years, three years on, and then it begins to look. So, um, I mean, as I said, very early days. My sense is that um, my sense is that there is a degree of circularity <coughs> here, which is kind of coming through in terms of you find what you expect to find because of the way in which your iterative processes start putting these people in the boxes in the in the first place. Um, and that's why I'm very interested in trying to find if there are ways of using um, kind of set theory, for example, uh, and kind of forms of kind to analysis to try and work out the dynamics of best fit in some of this data. But I mean, I think your, your straightforward question, will these generational um, kind of cohorts work in different contexts, is I expect they will, although maybe not quite so well, because we'll be looking at a different kind of powers of the, of the kind, of co kind, of, kind of key kind of cohering forces. Um, if Darwinism is the kind of critical shaper of, of a, of a, of a um, of a kind of high Victorian generation. It is clearly not going to work for large sections.